Jessica. It's strong. I think you might be trying to kill me. Hi guys. I come to you today from Florida. I feel like the luckiest person. Every week I seem to be coming to you from a different place, but I'm back in the States officially now and I've spent the past week in Florida with some of my family here and it's been so good and so nice to have some sunshine. Although it's been a bit of a weird week politically, but hey, you know what? This is not a political video. Jean made a video today doing the booktube not so newbie tag. This is Jean from Jean's Bookish Thoughts. And she mentioned me as a newish booktuber who she had just discovered. So I thought that it would be a great time after Jean had done this amazing shout out for me to give you some facts about me. It helps also that I've got a really bad ear infection right now and I don't trust myself to talk very eloquently about books. So there you go. I'm just gonna tell you some bookish facts about me. Now, one thing you have to know is that ordinarily when I make videos, I don't use notes apart from to remind me what order I'm gonna talk about stuff in. But today I'm gonna have to use notes, A, because my head isn't all there and B, because I can't remember these facts that I have noted and in what order I've noted them and they are important and ordered in a specific way. So if you see me looking down, don't be surprised. It's just me reminding myself what the hell I'm going on about. Anyway, enough rambling. Let's just get into the facts and hopefully you might find some of these a bit informative or at least quite fun. Number one, the first book I ever wrote was called Tap Tap and it was written in the back of a scraggly notebook with a broken spine in a mixture of pen and pencil. It was comprised entirely of letters, emails, chat room histories, which makes it feel really old because do people still go on chat rooms and um, diary entries. The male main character's name changed about six times based on who I and the co-author had a crush on at the time, but I think we settled on Leon in the end. Anyway, I still have that notebook somewhere, so maybe when I'm a book to you veteran sometime, we can read out of that book. Number two, I learned to read before I learned to walk, which isn't actually all that surprising when you consider that I only learned to walk when I was six and up till that point I was pretty much crawling everywhere, but there wasn't much to do when you couldn't run around. So I guess reading beat walking by about two and a half, three years. Number three, you can really tell I love someone if I want to read aloud to them. I love reading aloud to people. I once went to visit my best friend Megan in university in Birmingham. I was at Durham at the time and she was studying in Birmingham and we spent the weekend together and I read her a book and we finished it when I was in the train station about to leave and we sat in the train station crying and she told me that I should make a career out of reading audiobooks and I have never forgotten that compliment. It's probably one of the best that I've ever gotten and since then I've adored reading aloud to people. Number four, I have DNF'd a shameful amount of books over the years. I'm so bad at DNFing. I went through a phase when I would read about six books at the same time when I didn't know that I just didn't have the focus to do that and my brain just doesn't work that way. Better to focus on one or two and really give them my full attention. But that meant that so many books got left by the wayside even if I was really enjoying them, which is such a shame and I could never go back and remember what all of them were. Yeah, just so many DNFs. And my phone locked. That's useful. Number five, I hate the Hunger Games. Sorry, it's really popular on BookTube, but I just never got into it. I think everyone's a bit whiny. I don't give a fuck about the love triangle. Ugh, I don't know. There are, to me, there are much better dystopians out there, which is really sad because I know Clem is probably watching this and she loves The Hunger Games and she did everything she could while we were in university to try and make me love them, but I just don't. I'd rather read the book she wrote, if that helps. It's much better than The Hunger Games. <laughs> Clem is one of my best friends in all the world and she is a very talented author and has this amazing book and I hope one day to be reviewing it on this channel. But in the meantime, maybe one day I'll get her on and we can talk about it. Number six, if someone asked me what my favorite book is, 
I get legitimate anxiety, <laughs> like sweaty palms, heart racing anxiety. It causes me a lot of stress. And right now is no exception. I could not tell you what my favorite book is. I do really, really like Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close though. That book turned me upside down, inside out in a way that a book really hasn't. Number seven, when we first started dating, my now husband read aloud to me over Skype and we read his favorite nonfiction book, which is called Last Chance to See by Douglas Adams. Anyone who is a fan of nature or animals or even Douglas Adams should get a hold of it. It really is an absolutely fascinating book about nature and animals and humans' relationships to the planet and um, the importance of conservation and stopping animals going extinct, basically. It's his favorite book of all time. I think he's gifted it to his mom about five times and she still hasn't read it, but I absolutely loved it. And of course, it's really funny because it's Douglas Adams. It took us about seven months to read because I kept falling asleep because of the time difference. He would read two pages and I would be asleep. But when we finished it, he said to me that he knew and hoped that we would spend the rest of our lives together because every time he tried to read a book with a previous girlfriend, they'd never managed to finish. So hopefully that's a good omen for our marriage right there. Speaking of marriage, number eight, I wouldn't be married if it weren't for books, really. Philip and I met in a Facebook group come Accidental Cult, which actually started as a place to talk about YouTube and the Vlogbrothers and John Green's books. It was kind of really not that at all <laughs> by the end, but, uh, but that's what it started off as. So I will always have a soft spot for John Green and his books for that reason. Thanks for the husband, John. Number 10, Radiance by Catherine M. Valente opened my heart and my mind to science fiction. I'm scared of it really, science fiction. It makes me feel even more confined to this super claustrophobic earth in a way it should really do the opposite, but it just reminds me of how human I am and how I can't time travel and I can't do any of those things. And so I've never really been open to that type of book. I kind of worry that I don't have the imagination for sci-fi or the right kind of imagination, when actually that's, that's you know, really silly. I think I would like some sci-fi and not other types of sci-fi, and I think that's totally okay. But that book, ugh, I, I just think it'll influence most of what I write and most all the films I make in the future. An interplanetary world where all films are silent and every creative distance is within reach. It's honestly one of the most stylistically beautiful books I've read in the past couple of years and I highly recommend it to anyone. That was Radiance by Catherine M. Valente. Why did the TV just go? <laughs> How did that even happen? Is there a ghost in this house? Damn it, Chaz. Number 11. When I reach a thousand subscribers, which newsflash guys, at time of filming, we are 403 away from a thousand subscribers, which is just crazy. In Jean's video, she reminded me that I have been making videos for four months, which is a bit shameful because I've only made 12 videos. But I think 600 subscribers and 12 videos is something I'm really proud of. And I just couldn't have done it without any of you, obviously. So thank you for sticking with me and thank you to all the loyal and one-time commenters. I am so appreciative of every single discussion we have in the comments. But anyway, so when I reach a thousand subscribers, I'm going to take a weekend to go and haul myself up somewhere away from home, hopefully with no distractions, very little internet, and I'm finally going to read House of Leaves. I have heard such mixed things about this book. I know that it is an endeavor, that it's something that you have to commit to, and for me, I'm intrigued by the kind of mystery element. I love a book that I have a part in figuring out and solving, just kind of like, I don't know, playing Cluedo, I guess. I used to love that kind of game when I was younger, and uh, I'm just excited to kind of 
put myself back in that mindset. So that's what I'm going to do when I've reached a thousand subscribers and you never know, maybe I'll even vlog it and bring you guys along. Number 12. I've spoken about this before on my channel, but The Vegetarian by Han Kang is probably the most affecting book I've read in the past three years. And that is saying a lot. It terrified me and enchanted me all at once. And I think everyone should read it. Number 13. I read Louise Renaissance Georgia Nicholson series entirely in French from book one to the last book. And that was because I only came across them when I was on holiday in my house in France and I had only the French bookshop for company and the cover intrigued me, so I picked them up. And now reading them in English makes me feel really weird. I know that so many people love them and I did too, but I think reading anything to do with Georgia Nicholson in English would be so weird to me, which is really strange considering that that was its original publication language. But there you go, there's a weird language fact for you. Is this an intermission? It's a fish. It's a fish. <laughs> Number 14. Guys, I hate to be materialistic and all, and I know that what matters inside of a book are the words and the content and the work that's gone into it. But you know what? Font matters. If I don't like the font, I'm gonna have a problem. <laughs> And this is what I always look at in a bookstore. If I'm intrigued by a book, I'm gonna look at the font. And you know what I've noticed? There's often really bad fonts in American editions of books. I've often come across English editions that have been absolutely fine and American editions that are absolutely hideous. So work on your fonts, America. I don't know, it just distracts me. I wouldn't not pick up a book, I would still buy it but it's just gonna be distracting to me the whole time. I love, love, love Ali Smith and actually anything that's playful with language and form. Books that are like that make me feel the way that a good piece of music makes you feel. You know that feeling when your lungs get slightly too big for your chest and are kind of actively swelling whilst you're doing the thing that is causing you so much joy? That sounds really hideous when I describe it, but it's actually a really nice feeling, I swear. Does anyone know the lung swell feeling? I know the lung swell feeling. You guys, get down in the comments and tell me you know the lung swell feeling. But the book that I'm currently reading, which I will review very soon, is The Tidal Zone by Sarah Moss. And the playfulness with language and the willingness to push the boat out when it comes to form and do some risky stuff really unapologetically is absolutely giving me that feeling. So if any of you haven't heard of The Tidal Zone by Sarah Moss, which I don't know how you haven't because Booktube is absolutely obsessed with it, please go and pick it up if you like that sort of thing. Another book which I reviewed before on this channel which gave me that lung swell feeling was Preparation for the Next Life by Atticus Lish, which is some of the most inventive and creative use of language I've seen in a very long time. Number 16. I love to listen to music while I read. Some people think it might be distracting, but I think it really enhances my own personal experience. So. The composer Ludovico Inaudi is a really good composer for me to listen to while I read. It's non-lyrical music, so it's mostly just piano and sometimes some strings. And I just think he goes really well with most anything. He has some more up-tempo stuff and some more calm stuff. And I really associate him with a lot of important stories in my life now because he's accompanied me through many bookish journeys. Mozart's another one, sometimes Mozart. Number 17. I was once in a high school competition where you had to read aloud on stage to a panel of judges and also the audience, which was basically the whole rest of the school. You could read from anything you want, but I read from the diary of Anne Frank. The bit where they're about to get captured and everything is absolutely horrifying. And my stage fright was so bad that my entire body was stiff and my hands were shaking more than they've ever shaken. My voice was shaking and everyone thought that it was part of the act because of what I was reading. And uh, I actually won that competition. So 
Ever since then, that experience has always reminded me to use my fear as best I can. Although I really hope I can work on my stage fright soon. Let's go, it's refreshing. Number 18, this is so nerdy. When I was younger, about 11, the only phone numbers I knew by heart before I had my own mobile were my mom's, my dad's, and my local bookstores. Which by the way, I now have an official plan and date to take you guys to my local bookstore and I'm so excited. We're going to be talking to one of my favourite booksellers ever and we're going to have a really good time and it's going to be the first of many bookstore tours I think on my channel. So I'm super excited. Bloom beautifully, dangerously, loudly, bloom softly, however you need, just bloom. That's a quote from Rupi Kaur who is a wonderful poet. I read her collection, Milk and Honey, in 2016. And I think of that quote a couple times a week. I think I need to think of it more often, but maybe remind yourself of it. Put it up on your wall, put it somewhere in the corner of your head. It's a useful one. Number 20. My TBR list is over 120 books long. Booktube causes a problem, guys. I've had so many people come up to me who don't have Booktube, who say to me, I don't understand how I'm gonna get through all the books that you recommend, my lists are so long. And I wanna tell them, imagine if you watched 17 people who recommended you the same number of books each. Imagine what a long list you'd end up with then. After I finish the title zone, my next books on my TBR are Angels in America, which was a play kindly gifted to me by Amy, the bookshop book by obviously our very own Jen Campbell, which I've been meaning to get to for ages and ages, and A Brief History of Seven Killings, which was 2015's Man Booker Prize winner, which my dad gifted me not this Christmas, but last, and I really need to get around to it. It's a bit huge and intimidating, which is why I haven't got, got around to it yet. But as some of you may know, I don't know, but I am a quarter Jamaican, and so it is very much part of my heritage and the political situation and climate it was written in is very interesting and exciting to me. So I look forward to getting to that soon. Have any of you guys read it? Can you give me some positivity going into it? It won the man booker, so I don't think it's that bad. I stopped reading fiction. Oh, I forgot to say number 22. Number 22, <laughs> last one. I stopped reading fiction for four years, a long time. Horrible combination of undergraduate degree, depression and debilitating anxiety, which I still have, by the way. Just before I got married this year, I started watching Booktube. You guys are all responsible for rekindling my love again and giving me that life force, frankly. So thank you so much. There's nothing better than making these videos. I've been having so much more fun than I could ever have imagined. And watching you guys is like hanging out with friends and I just absolutely love it. So thank you for all the recommendations, all the support, all your lovely voices that have accompanied many days in bed and days at work for me. So. Yeah, I, I can't say thank you enough, but thanks. In June of this year, when I started reading again at a higher rate, I guess, I read eight books, which to put it in perspective was I think more than I read in the whole of 2013, just in June of 2016, which is kind of exciting. Did I just say in June of this year? We are in 2017. I think I'm in denial. I don't wanna be in 2017. 2016 sucked, but 2017 doesn't seem to be working out too hot either. Anyway, so I started with Americana, which I've discussed and raved about before on this channel, and then I read Kathy Ratzenbrink's beautiful, heartbreaking memoir of loss and family, which is called The Last Act of Love, which I wholeheartedly recommend to anyone who's interested in nonfiction, especially the memoir type. Her words stuck in me right in the middle of my chest, like pine needles in the best way possible. Can that be a good thing? Pine needles sticking in the middle of your chest? No, but for real, she reminded me of that thing that happened when you read and you're kind of hoping, I guess, that I 
go into more detail about what that thing is, but I don't think I'm going to because I can't describe it. It's just that thing that makes you live and makes you feel and makes you adopt many aspects of your identity and makes you realize things that were buried deep within yourself that you didn't know existed. And that's what Kathy's book did for me. And it is absolutely what I needed to remind me why I have loved reading since I was three, three and a half years old. And I am now 24, going on 25, and I still love it just as much. So all I can tell you whilst I love you and leave you is don't be scared if you lose your focus for a bit. I've said this multiple times on my channel, but don't be scared. Words literally felt like they were swimming in front of my eyes for four years. I could not focus on a single one of them. It comes back, guys. I promise. It comes back. Thank you so much for watching. This was so fun and I'll see you very, very soon back in LA. And in the meantime, thank you so much for your wonderful discussion that's been going on on mine and Amy's collaboration video about chronic illness and booktube, which was my previous video. That comment thread has given Amy and I so much pleasure and we love you all so much. And I really hope you've enjoyed my 25 random facts. It's not 25, is it? 22, couldn't come up for 25. 22, yeah, couldn't come up for 25. Felt too self-indulgent. So anyway, hopefully you haven't found it too self-indulgent and you feel like you've learnt more about the person behind the books. So yeah, I think that's me done for the night. I didn't even tell you that I have been drinking a dark and stormy. So in case you're starting the video from the end, go and get yourself a dark and stormy. Or, um, I don't know, get a dark and stormy and go and watch Amy or Jen or Jean or Simon or any of these lovely people. <laughs> I don't know. Have a good time, guys. Love you. Bye. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs>